Thank you, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you for all coming today. It's uh, nice to see some friendly faces in the audience. Some friendly faces in the audience. So. <laughs> My conscience is a long walk back from here to here, and I've got 20 minutes, so I'm going to try and rattle through this. Um, I'm going to be here today to talk about big data. Um, it doesn't... Oh. It doesn't seem too long ago that any conversations around health and well-being has some fairly casual references to these two, fuzzy and fluffy. I think it's um, a sign of the times, an encouraging sign of the times, how massively inappropriate that analogy now feels. You cannot escape how far up the corporate agenda, the HR agenda, health and well-being issues have now crept. If I was just trying to think about one issue in isolation, that of mental health, for example, and how much noise there has been in the media, in the public eye, around mental health over the course of the last 12 to 18 months. The heads together, the end of stigma. If I look at the, the, the line of public eye, figures in the public eye, celebrities promoting the need to speak about ven- mental health. Or if I think about the recent election, and I think how in an election that was allegedly going to be dominated by one issue and about personalities, and that the opening salvos contained references to mental health and are being thrown around like a political rugby ball with promises about increased investment. I know that the election thrown up a lot of uncertainty, but encouraging to think that some of those promises will still get delivered upon. But I'm afraid that Fluffy and Fuzzy there are going to get consigned to the home for stray dogs, cats and inappropriate PowerPoint metaphors. And instead, replacing that, I think is going to become conversations based on data. The statistics surrounding health and well-being are quite scary. I don't need to labour too many points here, but the numbers around mental health, 25% of working days lost each year are down to mental health reasons. 35 million working days lost due to musculoskeletal conditions. The statistics around cancer um, are scary. The one in two people will be affected at some stage during their, their lives. 500,000 people each year in the working population will be affected by cancer. That means 500,000 sets of work colleagues and line managers who have to deal with the impact of that for their organisation. Or I think about some of the stuff from Lancet around physical activity and how that represents just a significant health risk as smoking and obesity. What would you like to know? More and more employers are drawing the conclusion that those figures are staggering, command attention, and wouldn't I like to know what that looked like for my organisation? So, scarcely believable, but the next 15 minutes I'm going to cover all this off And there will be time for questions. Potentially there will be time for questions, easy questions at the end. I want to take a little while just to reflect back on some broader issues affecting employers today around the health and benefits arena. And I don't want to spend too much time labelling the points on the left-hand side of the screen, because I think these have been well documented. We all know there's price challenges, cost challenges, pressures on the benefit spend, medical inflation, disability costs, the increased understanding of the impact of ill health on employee absence, productivity, presenteeism. And I also don't labour too much around the shift, the increasing shift away from the state to third parties for looking after the health and welfare burden. That's not going to change in these uncertain times. And it's interesting to see how employers either can or want to react to that particular pressure. And likewise, down the bottom, about effective pathways, the choice between private and public health care. What is the optimal pathway I can access care for certain key conditions, particularly mental health, cancer, MSK and heart, the things that kind of crop up most often in the world in which we operate. I want to spend a little bit more time today focusing on the right-hand side, more modern issues. Ones about underlying health behaviours and how that impacts organisations. Around the increasing changing in the demographic, a multi-generational workforce that has five or six generations from baby boomers through to millennials, multicultural, multilocational. All of those individuals have very different engagement needs, all those individuals have very different healthcare needs. What is the best way I could get my message out to those people? And underpinning it, We've got data, piles and piles of data. How can I use data to empower my health and wellbeing strategy? There was a study that Aon worked in conjunction with the World Economic Forum a few years ago. And it suggested there were eight risks and behaviours that drove the 15 most cro- common chronic conditions that in turn accounted for 80% of costs for chronic illness worldwide. And I reflect on this, and I reflect on this with my day job as, a, as an insurance broker. I think I spend most of my time focusing down in this bottom corner here, almost all my time, perhaps historically. I'm worrying about stuff when it's already happened. And I perhaps spend a little bit of time talking about the management of those conditions, absence management. And perhaps the more evolved health and wellbeing programs of days gone by, that's where the focus was. It was around absence management. But then I think about how little time, historically, perhaps we've all spent 
looking at the underlying cause of ill health in the first place. The eight key behaviours that drive the 15 chronic conditions that account for those costs. And then I think about Aon as a firm. We're a risk management firm. We get engagement at the highest levels of the companies that we speak to when we talk about risk. This is risk. This is people risk. This is human risk. Why shouldn't we embrace the same themes in this sphere as my colleagues in our risk insurance business have been doing for years? Three ways you control the risk in our world. You can control the financing of the risk, broking. You can control the design of it, sometimes reactive, but wouldn't it be better if that was on an informed basis? Or the third way, you can improve the performance of the risk. And in our world, that means health. It doesn't come as a surprise to many that a modern health and wellbeing program doesn't just come and focus on physical wellbeing in isolation. It looks at physical and emotional wellbeing. Financial wellbeing has become increasingly relevant in, in recent times. And social wellbeing, a sense of connectivity with friends and colleagues. And we know there's interconnectivity here as well. We know that financial wellbeing, for example, has got a proven impact on both physical and emotional wellbeing. That 25% of working days lost through mental health, some studies suggest as many as a third of those, that might even be an understated number, are actually connected to financial reasons. Social. As an organisation, this is something Aon's placed great stock in in recent years. Uh, this is me campaign to promote disclosure of people with mental health issues across the organisation from fairly low level guys in the claims teams all the way up to the COOs of some of our business divisions. Work in the communities. Underpinning that, we recently carried out a health survey to try and understand what is it that employers want to do when designing their health and wellbeing programme. What is it if I agree that those are the things that are important to me, those are the risks that are important to me, what do I need to do to get there? And increasingly, understanding data has formed an important part of that process. So our 2017 survey asked a range of questions. 25% of clients responded that they currently use data to form their health and wellbeing strategy, but 40% said that they fully intended to in the near future. 60% do not currently understand or measure the impact of ill health on their organisation. But of that number, around 70% plan to start doing so pretty soon. 59% do not measure ROI. ROI, the holy grail of this business. Does it exist? 59% do not measure ROI, but very much like to. Only 15% currently measure ROI on their health and wellbeing spend. I think one of the first questions, perhaps the first question, any employer should ask themselves when deciding to either implement or refresh their health and wellbeing strategy, is what is it I'm trying to do? What is it in a year's time? Do I want to come back and say we've achieved with what we've done? And that can be from fairly simplistic, it's need to tick a box, corporate social responsibility, duty of care. But I think that's becoming increasingly uncommon. More often it has a specific aim to it. What is that specific aim for your organisation? Is it something fairly one-dimensional, looking at fewer insurance costs, creating a sustainable benefits programme? Historically, as I mentioned earlier, reducing absence costs was a key focus. Or in turn, perhaps the impact that that has on productivity in your organisation. Engagement. What is it your employees think about what we're doing? That's becoming increasingly relevant. Trying to improve underlying health behaviours, getting to the roots of the problem in the first place. That can be very powerful. Differentiate as employer, demonstrate ROI. Each one of those areas could be something that would be massively powerful to come back in a year's time and say, we did this and this improved and I can show you. Some of these things have got challenges to start with. You'd love to be able to do some of these things, but actually I'm not quite there yet. I don't record absence well enough to measure absence. So how on earth am I going to understand how I can improve underlying health behaviours if I don't have a benchmark to work with, a metric to start with in the first place? How can data help you do that? Well, it can set that bench line. Where am I now to start with? Where is it I'm going to try and get to? It can inform the decision-making process. It can quantify risk. If it wanted to, it could help you benchmark against peers. That may or may not be important. Segmented analysis. I'm going to mention that word a few times as we move through. Segmentation of analysis. Going back to that multi-generational, multicultural, multi-location workforce. Not all your employees will act the same way. There's an extension that goes past that. Personalization. I'll come on to that in a second. Altogether, it will help build a business case. It can help build targeted engaging comms. So we're all spending lots of money on health and well-being. So if your employees do not appreciate or have the message communicated in the most effective way, it can go to waste. 
understand demonstrating better performance in our world, we think this can help insu improve insurer um, pricing, underwriter confidence. Insurers hate uncertainty and they like to know that clients are moving in the right direction. This can be massively powerful information to present to markets. And again, chasing the holy grail. Measure improvement, demonstrate ROI. So what can I use? What data is available out there? Well, there's a lot of data. Benefits data, medical insurance claims, disability claims. And you can challenge your providers here. Provider MI has come in, uh, in leaps and bounds in recent years, but you have the ability to ask them to customise it. Do you know what? I'd also like to know this. Can you do that for me? Many of the leading providers should be able to provide another layer down of data to give them more def informed decision making. So benefits data. But then you also have absence data. Absence data is a much richer source of data. If I think about the spectrum of um, ill health, disability will provide me with so much information, medical expenses provides me with another layer down again. Absence data is a very rich source of data. And you can help you to that segmentation journey in a lot more detail. Occupational health data will sit there as well. Understanding exactly how that's utilised across the business, who utilises it, what they utilise it for. Behavioural data is more interesting. So behavioural data, what do we mean by behavioural data? Modern technology start to enable us to do this. Wearables, health apps, smartphones. It can unlock another very rich source of data. If I was to go back to my colourful man from earlier, that focuses on data right at the start, not necessarily down the other side of my chart, when stuff's already happened. You can get quite creative in this space. I've heard some employers who've looked at flex choices to see who takes cycles to work and who does this, that and the other. And I've also heard of employers that have investigated um, healthy eating campaigns and eating habits in staff canteens. Even waist size for bus drivers has been utilised as a symptom of a health trend and utilised to help fuel a debate around what to do next. And engagement data. So all very well, this is lots of empirical data that tells you what actually happens. What do your employees think of this? Does your employee engagement survey ask enough information about what they think about well-being, how important it is to them? Four broad areas. Underlying this, you'd have other issues. Demographic data, understanding what the makeup of the business is, and probably understanding what the strategic direction of the firm is, what direction you want to go, what's important, what fits, what doesn't fit, what communication channels are available. Lots of data, lots of ways to deliver it. And once you start understanding the data, you can start interrogating it, figuring out what it might tell you. And yes, rather simplistically, that might just be around high-profile information around the health risk that most impacts you and what parts of the business it impacts in. But you can start getting more granular. You can start looking at health impact by location. Yes, London is our biggest location, and obviously our costs are going to be highest there. But what are my hotspots? Where are my red zones? Where is the thing where disproportionately ill health affects the population more than it does in other areas? And why is that? Health profile by division. Maybe division is more important to you. Most organisations have got many different parts of the business, head office, logistics hubs, call centres. What parts of the business perform better than others? You can utilise that to understand performance. One of the most interesting studies we did for this was quite a few years ago, working with a financial services firm who had a very robust process about absence management. Everything was down in black and white. It looked really strong on paper. The tools were there. Data then allowed us to demonstrate exactly how well that was being enforced. Yes, you were meant to go referral into occupational health after 20 days, but on average, certain parts of your business did that at 70 days, 100 days. That therefore has a massive impact, particularly around conditions like musculoskeletal and mental health. That self-sustaining self study proved that the parts of the business that were doing things exactly the way the policy said they should, would you believe it, they had a better return around those two key health risks in particular, lower absence rates for mental health and musculoskeletal conditions, sanity checking the process. You can look around the demographic, gender, male-female split. What is your makeup of your population, male-female? What proportion of those claim for various things? And then start looking at age. This chart here is soon to have another bar at the end. The over 65s is starting to progress further. Health manifests itself in many different ways across the demographic. As people get older, the things that affect them change. This particular study shows that, yes, the mental health spikes in the early years, starts to drop off a bit at the end, other things start taking over. Segmentation. You can start aligning your health and wellbeing programme with real data. For some organisations, that might just be one approach, one message, absolutely fine. For others, a more detailed, more layered approach might be required. Segmentation. Utilising technologies, health apps, if you have a flex platform, the push and nudge notifications that can be turned on and off, 
you can get fairly bespoke messaging out to specific parts of your organisation just to nudge them and point them in the right direction, promote them certain things. Did you know? Dot, dot, dot. If that was the, the what and the where, this could be the when. Some sets of data enable you to show when ill health hits you during the course of the year. Absence data in this case. From a financial services firm, would you believe the spike in mental health conditions arrived in March and April time when the pressure was really on? World Mental Health Day is in May and lots of organisations do lots of stuff in May and it's great. But for this firm, they would think, actually, maybe if I did some stuff in January and February in advance of when my peaks start hitting, maybe that might be more appropriate. But is that appropriate for all my locations? Because this, that's fine in London, in my central hub, but what about in other areas where perhaps the pressures are different? and therefore a different message might be required at a different time of year. Again, how far you choose to do this is entirely up to each individual organisation, but the reality is that the same message communicated the same way might not have the same impact as it does in other areas. Once you've understood all the data and analysed and what's available, what's not available, you start to figure out how you could align what can be quite a scarce spend in this space. You can figure out either by pillar of well-being, or by health risk, or by location, or division, or demographic split. You could start figuring out, where am I currently doing this well? Where am I not doing this well? Where is it, if I could drag some spend from somewhere, I could invest that better? I think historically, most spend around health and well-being is actually quite back-loaded. It all arrives down at the end when people are already off certain. I'll get my steps up here. It, it arrives down here support, people are already off sick. Yes, some of it arrives in the need care space, medical expenses, occupational health services. How much of it arrives in avoid care? Education, changing behaviour, prevention. Across all these different splits, you could figure out exactly how well the current spend is aligned and figure out what's going to have the most impact for each employer. So once you take that all on board and figure out actually, I I've got some really useful data here. What is it I can actually, what's the process? What would I look like? What would it look like if I'm going to build an optimal health and wellbeing design? I think it comes into eight stages. Yes, it initiates the conversation. Data in its, it can take the form of just one single piece of information that drives a debate. Or it can be off the back of a broader piece of analysis. But the conversation is started, it's initiated. And then you start pulling together more data and understanding as a firm, what does our profile look like? What resources do we have available? What's working well? What's not working well? How could we make this work better? Put a plan in place. Execute the plan. Figure out how you're going to communicate this message to your workforce, given the channels of communication you have. Do I need to segment that message at all? Deliver. Measure and update. Again, data plays a massive part here. You can't measure and update if you didn't measure in the first place. You've set your benchmark. You've taken action. Things are hopefully improved. You measure it, you learn from it, you repeat. I've seen the flags go up, they say two minutes, I think, so. This is my last slide. Um, I, I finished with a kind of a call to action almost, to embrace the power of analytics and how much it can help drive activity in this space, to challenge your providers around what data is available, what you can have access to, what is appropriate to have access to and to think about how many areas you could actually access that from, be it benefits data, absence data, or more creative sets of data. And then understand how that can really help quantify risks, drive strategy, measure engagement, improve engagement, set a benchmark, control costs if that's, inform if that's important to you, inform decision making. And I think together that stands a very good chance of helping you guys as employers really differentiate yourself in what has increasingly become a very modern and relevant way with employees. Questions? Are there any questions? We do. We do have some oh, questions. Do we have any easy questions, I said? Oh, I don't know about that, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll ask you the top question, and then I'll be like, so, do you have any clients that can demonstrate return on investment on their wellbeing strategy? That's an excellent question. I refer to it as the Holy Grail for a reason, because I think the number of clients that truly can demonstrate ROI is fairly finite. If you ask providers, providers will tell you all day long about the ROI from their products. A little bit of a pinch of salt there. I think the most common way that ROI has historically been demonstrated was around absence. 
doing stuff that show, demonstrated reduced absence costs. So, so yes, but I don't think we're being creative enough about the ways that we can actually demonstrate it. I think the more different varied sets of data we can utilise, the better chance we have of demonstrating true ROI. Okay, thank you. And I suppose just one very, very quick last question. We talked about the eight risks that led into the 15 chronic conditions. Are those risks all equally weighted, or are there sort of one or two that are kind of super risks? Uh, that is a very good question. The only uh, content I can add around that is that there actually there's another statistic that went with that slide which weighted the ones that the employers that we surveyed around that set, and they put the, the key ones down were around physical inactivity and stress management. They were the two main ones for them. But that comes off the back of a broader EMEA survey and things like um, smoking cessation, and uh, obesity start to show up a bit more in some other territories. But the key ones from our study were around um, stress management and around physical inactivity. Okay, there you go, stress management and physical inactivity. Two, two main points to focus on there. You notice I glossed past the no drinking ones. So. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much indeed, Mark. That's been a great talk today, so uh, much appreciated. And thank you.